အားလုံးမဲ့မင်းလားပါအဲအဲလက်စ်နိုစကူမှာကြိုးဆိုပါတယ်ဒီနေရာတော့ကျွန်တော်ကလေးလာနေရာဒီစဗင်နေမြောက
your training data for y accordingly. So you call that y1, um, then this is y1001 through y2000. This becomes called y2 and so on until you have y5000. So now, mini batch number t is going to be comprised of x t and y t. And that is a thousand training examples with the corresponding input output pairs. Before moving on, just to make sure um, our notation is clear, we have previously used superscript round brackets i to index in the training set. So xi is the i training example. We use superscript square brackets l to index into the different layers of the neural network. So zl um, comes from the z values for the lth layer of the neural network. And here we're introducing the curly brackets t to index into different mini batches. So you have x, t, y, t. And to check your understanding of these, um, you know, what's the dimension right, of x, t, and y, t? Well, x is n x by m. So if one is a thousand training examples, or the x values for a thousand examples, then this dimension should be n x by 1,000, and x2 should also be an x by 1,000, and so on. So all of these should have dimension an x by 1,000. And these should have dimension 1 by 1,000. Right. To explain the name of this algorithm, Dash gradient descent refers to the gradient descent algorithm we've been talking about previously, where you process your entire training set all at the same time. And the name comes from viewing that as processing your entire batch of training examples all at the same time. I'm not sure it's a great name, but that's just what it's called. Mini batch gradient descent, in contrast, refers to the algorithm, which we'll talk about on the next slide, in which you process a single mini batch XT yt at the same time, rather than processing your entire training set xy at the same time. So let's see how mini batch gradient descent works. Hello? เอ่อเจเนเรตเลยสัจจิมีมาส่วนจิรอมจิรอกก่อนครับเอ่อติคุติมาเปียวตัวอ่ะเจอดีบอกว่าเกรดิเอนต์เซนต์โดยเฉพ
ဒီဖယ်လူတက္ကာနေစဲ့ဟိုကြောင့်ဘက်ဒါဆိုတက္ကာနေ to run mini batch training sense on your training sets, you would run for T equals one to 5,000 because we had 5,000 mini batches of size 1,000 each. And what you're going to do inside the for loop is basically implement one step of gradient descent using xt comma yt. And it's as if you had a training set of size 1000 examples. And it was as if you were to implement the algorithm you're already familiar with, but just on this you know, little training set size of m equals 1000. Rather than having an explicit for loop over all 1,000 examples, you would use vectorization to process all 1,000 examples sort of all at the same time. Okay? So let's write this out. First, you implement forward prop on the inputs, so just on xt. And you do that by implementing you know, z1 equals w1. Now, previously, we would just have x there. Right? But now you aren't processing the entire training set, you're just processing the first mini batch. So this becomes x t when you're processing mini batch t. Um, and then you would have a1 equals g1 of z1. Right? This would be a capital Z, since we're this is actually a vectorized implementation. And so on until you end up with um, a l. You know, as I guess, GL of ZL, and then this is your prediction. And you notice that here you should use a vectorized implementation. It's just that this vectorized implementation processes 1,000 examples at a time rather than 5 million examples. Next, you compute the cost function J, which I'm going to write as 1 over. 1,000, since uh, here 1,000 is the size of your little training set, sum from i equals 1 through l of really the, you know, loss of y hat i, y i. Um, and this notation for clarity refers to examples from the mini batch xt, yt. Um, and then if you're using regularization, you can also have this, um, regularization term, I guess maybe for two in the denominator times sum over L. You know, for Brini's sum, the weight matrix is squared. So because this is really the cost on just one mini batch, I'm gonna index this cost J with a superscript T in curly braces. So you notice that everything we're doing is exactly the same as when we were previously implementing gradient descent, except that instead of doing it on x, y, you're now doing it on x, t, y, t. Next, you'd implement backprop to compute gradients uh, with respect to, really with respect to this j, t. So you're still using only x, t, y, t. And then you update the weights. You know, W, really every WL gets updated as um, WL minus alpha D WL, and similarly for B. And so this is one pass through your training set using mini batch gradient descent. The code I've written down here is also called doing one epoch 
of training. An epoch is a, a word that just means a single pass through the training set. So whereas with batch gradient descent, a single pass through the training set allows you to take only one gradient descent step. With mini batch gradient descent, a single pass through the training set, that is one epoch, allows you to take 5,000 gradient descent steps. Now, of course, you want to take multiple passes through the training set, which you usually want to. You might want another full loop or another you know, while loop out there. So you keep taking passes through the training set until uh, hopefully you converge or have approximately converged. When you have a large training set, meaning batch gradient descent runs much faster than batch gradient descent. And it's pretty much what everyone in deep learning will use when you're training on a large data set. In the next video, let's delve deeper into meaning batch gradient descent so you can get a better understanding of what it's doing and why it works so well. <clears throat>
ဟိုဝဘ်ဆာရှ်ကန်ရတဲ့ဒေတာဆိုလို့ရှိရင်ဆင်တာကြီးပါအများကြောင့်အမှာဖေစ်ဘုတ်ဆိုရင်ကို
In this video, you learn more details of how to implement gradient descent and gain a better understanding of what it's doing and why it works. With batch gradient descent, on every iteration, you go through the entire training set and you would expect the cost to go down on every single iteration. So if you plot the cost function j as a function of different iterations, it should decrease on every single iteration. And if it ever goes up even on one iteration, then something's wrong. Maybe the learning rate's too big. On mini batch gradient descent, though, if you plot progress in your cost function, then it may not decrease on every iteration. In particular, on every iteration, you're processing some xt, yt. And so if you plot the cost function jt, uh, which is computed using just xt, yt, then it's as if on every iteration you're trading on a different trading set, or really trading on a different mini batch. So you plot the cost function j, you're more likely to see something that looks like this. It should trend downwards, but it's also going to be a little bit noisier. So if you plot j of t as you're trading mini batch gradient descent and maybe over multiple epochs, um, you might expect to see a curve like this. So it's okay if it doesn't go down on every iteration, but it should trend downwards. And the reason it'll be a little bit noisy is that maybe x1, y1 is just a relatively easy mini batch, so your cost might be a bit lower, but then maybe just by chance, x2, y2 it's just a harder mini batch, maybe even some mislabeled examples in it, in which case the cost would be a bit higher and so on. So that's why you get these uh, oscillations as you plot the cost when you're running mini batch gradient descent. Now, one of the parameters you need to choose is the size of your mini batch. So M was the training set size. On one extreme, if the mini batch size is equal to M, then you just end up with batch gradient descent. Right, so in this extreme, you would just have one mini batch, x1, y1, and this mini batch is equal to your entire training set. So setting the mini batch size to m just gives you back gradient descent. The other extreme would be if your mini batch size were equal to one. This gives you an algorithm called stochastic gradient descent. And here, every example is this O mini batch. So what you do in this case is you look at you know, the first mini batch, so x1, y1. But when your mini batch size is one, this just has you know, your first training example, and you take a gradient descent step with your first training example. And then you next take a look at your second mini batch, which is just your second training example, and take a gradient descent step with that. And then you do it with the third training example and so on, looking at just one single training example at a time. So let's look at what um, these two extremes will do on optimizing this cost function. If these are the contours of a cost function you're trying to minimize, so the your minimum is there, then dash grid descent might start somewhere and be able to take relatively um, low noise, relatively large steps, and you know, just keep marching to the minimum. In contrast, with stochastic gradient descent, if you start somewhere, let's pick a different starting point. Then on every iteration, you're taking gradient descent with just a single training example. So most of the time you hit toward the global minimum, but sometimes you hit in the wrong direction if you know, that one example happens to point you in a bad direction. So stochastic gradient descent can be extremely noisy, and on average, it'll take you in a good direction, but um, sometimes they'll head in the wrong direction as well. And so constant gradient descent won't ever converge. You'll always just kind of oscillate and wander around the region of the minimum, but it won't ever just head to the minimum and stay there. In practice, the mini batch size you use will be somewhere in between. 
somewhere between in one and m and one and m are respectively too small and too large and here's why if you use bash gradient descent so this is your mini bash size uh, equals m then you're processing a huge training set on every iteration. So the main disadvantage of this is that it takes too much time, too long per iteration, assuming you have a very large training set. If you have a small training set, then batch gradient descent is fine. If you go to the opposite, if you use stochastic gradient descent, then it's nice that you get to make progress after processing just one example. Um, that's actually not a problem. And the noisiness can be ameliorated or can be reduced by just using a smaller learning rate. But the huge disadvantage of stochastic gradient descent is that you lose almost all your speed up from vectorization. Because here, you're processing a single training example at a time. The way you process each example is going to be very inefficient. So what works best in practice is something in between where you have some, you know, mini batch size that's uh, not too big or too small. And this gives you, in practice, the fastest learning. And you notice that this has two good things going for it. One is that you do get a lot of vectorization. So in the example we used on the previous video, if your mini batch size was a thousand examples, then you know you might be able to vectorize across a thousand examples, which is going to be much faster than processing the examples one at a time. And second, you can also um, make progress Uh, without needing to wait till you process the entire training set. So again, using the numbers we have from the previous video, each epoch or each pass your training set allows you to take 5,000 gradient descent steps. So in practice, there'll be some in-between mini batch size that works best. And so with mini batch in the center, if you start here, maybe one iteration does this, two iterations, three, four, you know, and it's not guaranteed to always head toward the minimum, but um, uh, it tends to head more consistently in the direction of the minimum than stochastic gradient descent. And then it doesn't always exactly converge or oscillate in a very small region. If that's an issue, you can always reduce the learning rate slowly. We'll talk more about learning rate detail, how to reduce the learning rate in a later video. So if the mini batch size should not be M and should not be one, but should be something in between, how do you go about choosing it? Well, here are some guidelines. First, if you have a small training set, just use batch gradient descent. You know, if you have a small training set, then um, no point using mini batch gradient descent. You can process the whole training set quite fast. So you might as well use batch gradient descent. What does small training set mean? I would say, you know, if it's less than maybe 2000, um, it'd be perfectly fine to just use batch gradient descent. Otherwise, if you have a bigger training set, typical mini batch sizes would be um, anything from 64 up to maybe 512 are quite typical. And because of the way computer memory is laid out in access, sometimes your code runs faster if your mini batch size is a, is a power of two, All right? So 64 is uh, two to the six is two to the seven, two to the eight, two to the nine. So often I'll implement my mini batch size to be a power of two. I know that in the previous video, I used a mini batch size of 1000. If you really want to do that, I would recommend you just use you know, 1024, which is to the power of 10. And you do see mini batch sizes of size 1024. Um, it is a bit more rare. Uh, this range of mini batch size is a little bit more common. One last tip is to make sure that your mini batch, all of your XT, comma yt that that fits in um, you know cpu gpu memory 
and this really depends on your application and how large a single training example is. But um, if you ever process a mini batch that doesn't actually fit in CPU, GPU memory, whatever you're using to process the data, then you find that the performance suddenly falls off a cliff and, and it's suddenly much worse. So I hope this gives you a sense of the typical range of mini batch sizes that people use. In practice, of course, the mini batch size is actually another hyperparameter that you might do a quick search over to try to figure out which one is most efficient at reducing your cost function j. So what I would do is just try a several different values, uh, try a few different powers of two, and then see if you could pick one that makes your gradient descent optimization algorithm as efficient as possible. But hopefully this gives you a set of guidelines for how to get started with that hyperparameter search. You now know how to implement Mimi Bash gradient descent and make your algorithm run much faster, especially when you're trading on a large trading set. But it turns out there are even more efficient algorithms than gradient descent or Mimi Bash gradient descent. Let's start talking about them in the next few videos. อ่ามิชชั่นอะไรเนี่ยตู่เลยเนาะตู่ๆเว้ยสิโอเคครับครับมาเลยเนี่ยเนาะไอ้มาเลยมาเลยเซ็ตมาเลยน้าเลยเป
ကဲဒန်ထောင်းနဲ့ဒီမဲ့ဆိုရင်တော့ကျွန်တော်မီနီပတ်စ်ကရီးတယ်တစ်ဆောက်တောင်းဝမယ်ပေါ့ဒါမ
ဒီဒီတစ်ခုလုံးမှာပြီဘယ်လိုတွေနားလေလိုက်တယ်ပေါ့เนาะအကြံကြီးမှာပြီဘယ်လိုစမ်မရိုက်လုံးမလိုပ
computerization and the process is time consuming so to a tr a chain ko me lo to a to pyo da da la le to a ba ne so virtualization lo lo shin so nye ne wa da ba ni da stochastic ko twa u line na so lo shin ye da virtualization ya ya de speed di nye san ba mu a ba ma mati da da o po ma se virtualization twa nye ne da ne stochastic ja virtualization a lo pi nai ne speed a le ba ma mathu da o de ta da ho ho a pyo lo shin ye ตัวท่านน่ะดีเลยชาพี่ทุกคนเอ่อจนเราเนี่ยเปลี่ยนจบไอ้จนเราจบไปไปทําอะไรสิเนี่ยตัวเราเลยก่อนจนเราเนี่
ဒီဝါနဒီဝါနဒီတူနဒီတူနဒီတူနဒီတူနဒီတူနဒီတူနဒီတူနဒီတူနဒီတူနဒီတူနဒီတူနဒီတူနဒီတူနဒီတူန
Okay, I count this one uh, plus or minus. Plus or minus? Minus. 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 ตีดาอะไซเมนต์ตีดาซาวุ้ยกูเปล่าเนาะอ่าอะกูอ่ะหูว่าก็กูสกูตัวตัวเป็นสีเลยส่วนไอ้ไอ้ไอ้ไอ